my pleasure to introduce Tom, Cleantech investor, advisor, speaker, author, and entrepreneur. Mes amis, mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Ram. Every school kid has heard uh, this horrible story, right? Of the frog and the pot of water in the stove. And the story goes, you put a frog in the pot of water, put it on the stove, and if you heat the water up slowly enough, at just the right temperature, um, the frog won't realize it's in trouble until it's too late, and it's too hot, and it's paralyzed, and the poor little guy will boil to death. It's a horrible story. I don't know if anybody's tried it, I don't recommend it, but, but it's a very powerful metaphor, right? Um, and one might say it's an overstated metaphor for climate. If you look at the peer-reviewed expert consensus science, right, the stuff that comes out of the National Academies of Science and so on, we're headed for four to six degrees of warming, and this is an absolutely terrifying thing. Don't think of it so much as temperature, as energy. We're adding, with the extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we're adding the energy equivalent, I kid you not, of 400,000 atomic bombs every day. That is an enormous amount of energy that is going into our, our atmosphere and our oceans, which will wreak havoc of which we don't really know. No one really knows what happens past two degrees. Pretend we do, we have no idea. So it's very dangerous territory. The point I'm making is that that's a very hot pot, hence the metaphor is appropriate, and the kinds of actions we're taking are akin to building out the Titanic with a teaspoon, right? We are effectively paralyzed. Carbon counts are accelerating in the wrong direction. Right? There are places that are reducing their emissions, but as, a, as the world, not even close. And even those that are reducing their emissions, they're nowhere near the kind of emission reductions we need to make to stop at two degrees. So every time a weird weather event happens, right, we sort of get a little more suspicious as to what's happening. And it's absolutely true that weather is not climate. No single event is climate change. That's not how it works. But it's like, just like no pixel is a picture. But as more pixel, pixels emerge, one begins to see the picture. And the kinds of things that we've been seeing, Superstorm Sandy, the drought in Russia in 2012 that was so severe it shut down international grain shipments for 30 days. Australia, you know, floods and fires of biblical proportions. These are appetizers. Right? These are appetizers for the main event. So that's the pot we're in. I'm not going to dwell on this. But I'm interested in the metaphor for another reason. Because I'm interested in actually trying to solve this problem. Right? So just like there is um, something about the frog's physiology that locks it into place. Right? There are rules of that frog's physical system, presumably rooted in his DNA, that predetermines that it will sit paralyzed in that pot. So too, I think there are rules beneath the surface of our systems, our cognitive systems, our economic systems, our financial systems, and our political systems. Beneath the surface, rules of the game, so to speak, that lock us into place. Unlike that frog, though, we make the rules by which we operate to some extent. And so if we can dive beneath the surface we, and identify what's locking us into place, what rules of the game are keeping us paralyzed, we can presumably change those rules and hop into action. Right? That's why I'm interested in that metaphor. I want to find out what it is about our physiology, our systems by which we engage with each other and with the world that lock us into place. Because I'd like to, un I'd like to unlock that frog. Hence, waking the frog. Um, really, it's, it, the, the story is fairly simple. I divide it into four regions, cognitive, um, economic, finance, markets, and so on. Roughly, look, it's really hard to believe this is happening. It is difficult for our minds to take on board that this problem is as bad as it is. And there are reasons why it's hard to believe, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. Once we figure it out, so it's, oh, I see the light, oh, God, it's real, I'm worried, we feel like our hands are tied. Because we have to go to work every day, we have to make a living. If we're an executive, we have to keep that company profitable. So we feel like our hands are tied, even if we figure out the scope of the problem. And our hands are tied because we're subject to market forces. And those market forces feel very powerful. It's very hard to buck that trend. <coughs> Global market forces. You've got to make a buck in the market. And lastly, the last sort of refuge of the sort of the skeptic is to say, and it will cost too much. So if you buck those market forces after having figured it out, this is a bad deal, as Bjorn Lomborg would say. It's going to cost too much. And I think all are false. I think all can be dealt with. But we need to approach it in a systemic way to understand how we can untie our hands and so on. So let's start with how we think. When I talk about denial, I am not only referring to what I call active denial, which is saying it's not true. 
There will always be people who need to be dragged, kicking and screaming in the 21st century. This is a free world. You can believe what you like. More pernicious, I think, is what I call passive denial, which we are all guilty of, myself included, all of us. Passive denial, if asked, one would say, yes, it's true. I believe the National Academy of Science. Probably NASA knows what they're talking about. <laughs> so it's likely true. But we go about our day-to-day -day lives as if it weren't the existential problem that it is. Four to six degrees is not something human civilization in its current form makes it through. Never mind economic growth, that our institutions survive, that our food sources survive. It's an existential problem. All of us necessarily go about our day-to-day -day lives as if it weren't that big of a problem. And there are reasons for that. It's a siren song, right? Sirens were, in Greek, I think it's Greek mythology, sang songs of irresistible beauty so sailors would be lured to their deaths. Our brains have a siren song, too. So let's, think, let's talk about how we think. Um, from the day we're born, throughout our lives, what our, bra our brains are not computers. Right? They're neural networks. And what that means is, from the moment you're born, throughout your life, you're making connections between sounds, ideas, words, events, concepts, people, and your brain is literally hardwiring these things together. It's an, asso called an associationist engine, fast automatic. The vast majority of our thinking is done this way. So there's different ways of describing it. There's conscious, unconscious, slow, fast, uh, deliberative, intuitive. Those delineations mean roughly the same thing. And it is the unconscious parts of our brain, the part that has automatic, fast associations between ideas that far and away dominate our thinking. Once you have enough of these connect connections throughout your life, right? Mom, lovely, zoo, scary, dog, fun, money, powerful. These associations form our worldview. And that worldview is how we make sense of the world, right? It's how we, unlike computers, can be put into a situation and make sense of it. It's common sense. That's all it is. Common sense is the thing you can't teach a computer. Because computers don't work that way. Our brains work that way. And we bring it with us wherever we are. It's automatic. It's fast, it's unconscious, and it's how we filter the infinite amount of information coming in at any one time, and it's how we make sense of things in an open-endedly complex environment. It's what neural networks do. And it becomes quite sophisticated, and it can be culturally relevant. <clears throat> and what it does is it filters your response to new beliefs, because you have to continue to make sense of the world. And in the Western world, one big way in which we all approach things is the notion of progress. Tomorrow is better than today. Right? That's a deeply embedded piece of our worldview. Now, I'm not saying we sit there and repeat to ourselves, I think that tomorrow is better than today. It's implicit. It's unconscious. It's part of our cultural heritage. Ever since Sir Francis Bacon talked about opposable thumbs and a rational mind, nature is ours to control. Right? The kind of hubris that comes with that. The market can grow up, the economy can grow up forever. Human ingenuity knows no bounds. I'm not saying these beliefs are false, far from it. There's a reason we hold them. Our lives and culture to this point have conditioned us to take that as true. It served us well until now, right? The problem is, so I'm not saying they're false. What I'm saying is climate disruption runs counter to all of those beliefs. So when climate change comes knocking at your door, your brain will play all kinds of tricks. Every human being's brain. I'm not making a moral judgment. I'm not. It's an empirical fact. Everybody's brain, when a belief comes knocking at its door that disrupts a worldview and causes discomfort, your brain will play all kinds of tricks to keep it at bay. Denial is one of the outcomes of all those tricks. Unless we think this is sort of uh, 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 abstract, um, you can measure the ways in which we do this. Right? They're called cognitive biases. And there's a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Dan Kahneman that goes over a lot of this. This is bog-standard bog cognitive science. So the first thing our brain wants to do is avoid discomfort. And so our default belief is going to be your brain will do a, a bait and switch. What do you think about climate disruption? Your brain, well, it's complicated. It's slightly frightening. And what your unconscious brain will do is answer a different question. How does it make me feel? And it makes me feel uncomfortable. And so everybody's default position, everybody, will be, it can't be that bad. That's our default position. 
because the brain was, is the equivalent of a low energy state. That's the winning effort. And then what we all do is we seek evidence that confirms that bias. And if you want evidence that climate change isn't that bad, just go on the internet. Turn on Fox News. There's a ton of data that we will seek out. I do it too. I read the paper and there'll be a headline which might not be as bad as it is. I go to that thing like it's dark chocolate. Right. So, and even in science, you know, the confirmation bias is a well understood effect. Even in the empirical sciences, it's hard to avoid confirmation bias. Seeking to confirm beliefs you already have. Right? So you start out by thinking it can't be that bad, because that's what your brain will do automatically to protect its existing worldview. Then you will seek evidence that confirms that belief. And then someone, someone must argue with you and say, well, here's all the data that says, you know, maybe it's really bad. Well, the affect heuristic says if you don't like the conclusion of an argument, then you won't believe the argument. We're not rational, right? We're not Dr. Spock. We're Captain Kirk. <laughs> And lastly, peer group bias, that we take the opinions of our peers as far more important evidence for our belief systems than experts. Pointy headed scientists, NASA, whatever, it's our peers, our brothers or sisters, uh, uh, famous people on TV are a part of our peer group, believe it or not, our neighbors, our coworkers. So you can see how over 20 years, how it is that we suddenly found ourselves sleepwalking through this problem. Because all of us start by thinking it can't be that bad because it contradicts a lot of the ways in which I see myself and a lot of my culturally embedded worldviews, which are fast, automatic, and condition my response to the world. I find lots of evidence that confirms that. Right? I don't really like the conclusion of people who give me the arguments that says it's really bad, so I ignore that, and I don't believe the argument, and I'm surrounded by people that think the same way. So collectively, that's what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So the question is, and I think marketers know that, I don't think this is news to a marketer, I think people understand. So the, the problem is, the, the, the environmental community has responded to the challenge of climate disruption and the ongoing set of, of uh, public figures who still have the audacity to say it's not true, to say, if only there was the right evidence out there, right? If only we got the Margaret Wentys of the world out of the way and had a scientifically literate conversation in international papers, people would get it. That's not the case. Because we're not rational. Because we're wonderfully human, we're Captain Kirk, not Dr. Spock. And if we understand that, then the strategy of those who are trying to wake the frog will change. And I think the way we do it, to wake up our little frog, is we work backwards from what the solution might look like. So we, we talk about a future in which we've rebuilt an energy system from one that's been built on finite resources and extraction to one that's based on technology, underwritten by an economic stimulus, the likes of which we haven't seen in two or three generations, high tech, and so on. I've written extensively about how this is possible. There's a guy called Mark Jacobson at Stanford who's talked, he's got very fine details state by state in the United States, how you can decouple economic activity from, from carbon emissions. It's entirely feasible. Talking about clean energy abundance speaks to the best of ourselves. Resilient, innovative, future thinking, right? So I think if we talk about the solution at the same time that we acknowledge the depth of the problem, we see a way out. And we see a way out that speaks to a world view of ourselves that we already hold. So we're not going to be so defensive. We go on cognitive offense in a way. Right? We can imagine how our default position would be to say, I want that future. So our default position is, I like it. Because it confirms the best of ourselves. And then the affect heuristic, I'm making an argument about how it's possible. I like the conclusion of that argument. We're not going to send money overseas for oil anymore. We're going to have clean air. It's going to be a locally underwritten economy, energy economy. I like that argument, so I'll believe it. <laughs> and we have more and more community leaders talking about it. And we have more and more examples of how Canada is actually stepping up to the game and doing this. Peer group bias now works in our favor. So you can see how if we change the story and start from the solution and work backwards, then we might, be, we might be a little less defensive about the problem. And believe me, Canada is in this game. My, uh, my uh, venture firm and at Mars, we are investing in technologies that, will, that can upset global energy flows. Little Canadian companies, Morgan Solar, will be able to produce solar power at three and a half cents a kilowatt hour this year in the oil-rich Mideast, backed by the Kuwaiti National Fund. 
Hyperstore, a little tiny little company out of Toronto again. Underwater compressed air energy storage. Basically, you put giant bags at the bottom of the ocean, and when you want to store energy, you fill them with air. Look, drill underneath it, come up. And that stores the energy, and when you want it back, you run it in reverse. There's some complexities, heat exchange and stuff like that. But it's basically a giant battery. It's the lowest cost grid scale energy storage on the planet. That's a Canadian company. There's a Canadian company called Wilton Biofuels, which is positioned to make ethanol, a gasoline replacement, out of wood chips, which I think you have a lot of around here, into gasoline, get cheaper than the gasoline. They will be the lowest cost liquid fuel producer in North America, no subsidies, Canadian company. I was at Metallic having a three-day ski vacation with some really interesting folks from Edmonton, which was a really, well, at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> really great people from Edmonton. These are, these are, these are top-notch folks. Metallic has a 65 kilowatt microhydro system powering the whole place. It's the most guilt-free sauna I've ever enjoyed. <laughs> and I have, I've talked to at least a dozen people in Nelson. When they find out I'm an energy geek, they immediately start talking about this uh, district energy system built on biomass that they're thinking about in Nelson. Immediately they get excited about it. So it's not just the super high-tech stuff like Morgan Solar, it's also making use of the resources around us, which Canadians have done forever. And the more of these kinds of stories we have, the more we believe that future is possible, and the more we're going to be willing to acknowledge the problem. Back in 2002, all kinds of groups tried to predict how much solar energy would be coming down the pipe a decade away, 2012. The only people that got it right is the International Energy, Ener energy Agency was in there, the American Energy Information Agency, all kinds of folks. <clears throat> the highest bid on terms of the number of gigawatts that would be installed in 2014, so that's all 14, was one gigawatt. The only group that came close to how much solar got installed in 2014 was Greenpeace. Those tree-hugging nuts over Greenpeace. <laughs> the only ones that came close, and they were off by a factor of two. 48 gigawatts got installed in 2014. That's the equivalent of 48 nuclear plants. Capacity factor is another thing, but it can give you a sense of scale. Solar is increasing so fast, you don't know you're on an exponential curve until it really starts to go. And that's what's happening with solar right now. Solar is competitive without subsidies in 19 jurisdictions right now, including Mexico and China. By 2016, it's estimated, and in 49 of 50 states, and I'm sorry for referring to the Americas in this, but that's what other reports are about, 49 of 50 states, rooftop solar will be competitive with the price of retail electricity, no subsidies. There's so much solar going up on so many rooftops right now in the United States that utilities are seeing their very, their very business model threatened, and they're fighting back. They're trying to prevent, through law, people putting solar on their rooftops. <laughs> They thought it was a hippie thing three years ago, and now they see their business under threat. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, that's what, so that, that future is coming. Now, there's going to be losers. I mean, we have to be honest and say coal miners have to be out of work in five or six years. They do. There's a great study. Again, I think it was Mark Jacobson at Stanford who did this. pointed out that the amount of skilled trades you need to retrofit the building stock in North America, right? Local trades, you can't outsource that stuff, right? It's buildings here, it's our stock. Is two orders of magnitude, if you did it over a period of 30, two orders of magnitude more than the number of people working in the coal sector, right? A hundred times the jobs that are available, retrofitting building stock, just that alone, than you get from coal. So there will be losers, and we have to be honest about that, and we just make a transition, right? We make a transition. So that's, I think, how we get a little froggy to wake up as we begin to talk about stories of clean energy abundance. And we have these sort of cognitive biases working in our favor rather than against us, right? Because the solution speaks to that worldview that is already embedded in our unconscious minds, that shapes our response to new, to new beliefs. And that's how I think we wake the frog up. Well, that's all very nice, Tom, uh, very morosey. Um, what about all those fossil fuels that we need to leave in the ground, right? So, you know, the you know, CEO of, a, of, a, of an oil and gas company goes to work and says, you know, I have a problem. One of the things the environmental movement has not done, I think, well enough is acknowledge what's true. Fossil fuels are one of the single most important reasons why life in the 21st century is so grand. I didn't, I didn't walk here. I flew. Right? 
The fossil fuel party is an amazing party. It's half the reason that uh, humans came out of the trees in the 21st century. It was like disposable thumbs and rational life is a cheap, abundant energy source. I mean, you do acknowledge that. The problem is, of course, like every, everybody knows, the better the party, the worse the hangover, right? And that's the problem that we face uh, coming down. But nobody wants that party to end, right? Like, that's the one thing we need to acknowledge. That's why life is so good right now. We spend globally $5 trillion on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels power our civilization. And it is reasonable for an engineer working at a, at, a, at a utility company, it's reasonable for a politician, it's reasonable for an investment banker to say, you're going to rebuild that? It sounds dangerous to me. How, do I know, you know, how are we going to keep our factories humming? It's a reasonable response to be cowed by the infrastructure we've built over several generations. Vaclav Schmil, you know, the University of Manitoba, has an argument, and I think it's a very good one, that if you look historically, even if you have a better, faster energy source, right? So the Morgan Solars and Hydro Stores of the world, so they're all real, they're all coming fast, here comes the exponential curve, it still takes on the order of a half a century to a century to replace energy infrastructure. Even if it's better, faster, cheaper. That's the nature of energy infrastructure. So for, for, for Vaclav, he believes we're historically determined. We are historically determined to fail in this project. Because it will take 50, 200 years to solve this problem. We don't have that long. We have maybe 20. So the lesson here, hold this thought in your minds for a moment. All else being the same, we are historically determined to take too long. That's the nature of infrastructure. But if all else is not the same, then we can break out of that pattern. So we need to change the rules. Right? If we don't change the rules, I believe that club is right. We are historically determined to take almost a century. So we need to change the rules in order not to be historically determined. So you have a CEO who says, oh, I saw this talk. I totally get it. We have to leave three quarters of known reserves in the ground. We're, we as a company are going to start. We're going to show an example. We're going to leave three quarters of our known reserves in the ground. What do you think would happen to that CEO? <laughs> They're fired. The board of directors would have no choice but to fire them. When personal conscience bumps up against fiduciary obligation in a, in a corporate environment, it is fiduciary obligation that wins every time. It's written into our corporate law. Remember the movie uh, I, Robot, based on a novel by Isaac Asimov? The robot's got a prime directive, right? Everything else that robot does is subservient to the prime directive, which to the robot is something like, don't harm humans or something like that. Corporations have a prime directive. It is to make profit. And if you run against that prime directive, you will get run over. The point is, we should expect, it is rational, it is not unusual, it is not malfeasance for fossil fuel companies to fight on the bitter end to burn every one of their reserves, every, every drop of oil, every ton, every ton of building. They have to. It's written into corporate law that they have to. So what do we need to do? We need to change the rules so that those enlightened CEOs, and there are many of them, can go into work and say, we're an energy company, not a fossil fuel company. Because right now, it's very difficult for them to do that. Their hands are tied. So we need to change the rules. We need to change the rules so we're not historically determined to take 50 years. We need to change the rules so that personal conscience and fiduciary obligation can be aligned within the corporate world. And lastly, the last thing we should expect is this sort of billionaire, hedge fund, enlightened, super savior, the Richard Branson's of the world to come along and save us. It's not going to happen. Tom Steyer, if anybody know Tom, he's a billionaire hedge fund manager in the United States who gets the problem, who quit his job. He ran one of the biggest pension, or, uh, hedge funds in the world, and he's become a climate hawk, right? Trying to get American politicians engaged on this issue. And he likes to say, look, I talk to my billionaire buddies, and I ask them, look, you're a smart guy. Why aren't you worried about this? Why aren't you with me? Why aren't you helping me solve this problem? And the answer is, it's probably one of the most honest things someone could say at that point. Look, I live in a penthouse apartment in downtown Manhattan, and my fridge is always full of food. Why is it my problem? So we shouldn't expect enlightened self-interest to solve this problem. John Kenneth Galbraith made hay out of this, Canadian economist back in the 60s, talking about um, conventional wisdom, which is a coin he termed 
which is essentially a set of beliefs that the elite have that enable them to continue to protect the status quo, even if it's against their long-term self-interest. Mm -hmm. Conventional wisdom on Wall Street is, it's not my problem. It's your problem if Pakistan runs out of water. It's a nuclear station, a nuclear nation. It's, our, it's your problem if Russia runs out of grain and can't ship it out because they have a heat wave. It's your problem. That's not, that's not, it's not immediate to them. So my point being, we, need to change, we can't wait for enlightened self-interest to solve the problem. We have to change the rules of the game so it is in their self-interest. And it's self-evidently in their self-interest. In their short-term self-interest and their long-term self-interest. Because the trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that Wall Street and Bay Street control will decide whether or not we solve this problem. The capital is there. It's sitting in our pension funds. It's sitting in money market funds. But until it's unlocked, until the professional classes who manage our money figure out this is a problem, we're not going to deploy that capital the right way. We have to change the rules so it's in their self-interest to do so. So I said change the rules three times. That's what we need to do to make, make our fraud. Change the rules to align fiduciary obligations with personal conscience, to ensure that we're not historically determined to take 50 to 100 years to solve this problem, and to, and to ensure that self-interest of the elite who handle the capital that flows through our system move it into a solution. So it isn't obvious in their self-interest. And, to, and there we are. So we need to change the rules. And that's how we untie our hands. But what do I mean by change the rules? As soon as you start talking about changing the rules, a free market ideologue will point out that it's a very bad idea. <laughs> the story, as you know, goes like this. In order for the market to be a... It's what I call the myth of the free market. Why do I call it a myth? Well, the story goes, in order for the market to be a... This is from Adam Smith right through the Chicago School of Milk Freedom, right? So like the neo neocon movement, the World Bank in the late 90s. In order for a market to be efficient, you have to, you have to be unfettered to find equilibrium. Equilibrium is a magic place where supply meets demand. Goods are infinitely substitutable one for another. No Pareto optimization. Happiness is maximized. And self-interest is like gravity. It's what gets us there. That's the classic story of why markets need to be left alone to be efficient. The reason I call it a myth, first of all, I don't know what a free market is. Markets require structure. So it's never a matter of free or not free. It's a matter of how free, right? At the very least, we need contract law and maybe capital controls on banks <laughs> to have a kind of functioning economy. So it's always a matter of what kind of structure. Second, the wealth that we have today did not come from unfettered self-interest operating in a market in a free market by itself. Aerospace, internet, uh, automotive, all of these industries came about because of a subtle interplay between the public and private sectors. There was a strategic backing of those industries. Right? So it's never been the free market operating on its own. Clean tech is no different. Um, and so, so and lastly, the idea of equilibrium in the first place was only introduced into that story because there was no other way to solve the math back in the 18th century when they were building these models. Right? They had to assume there was one point of equilibrium or it was unsolvable. So the whole notion of letting something find equilibrium is a leftover, is an artifact of out-of-date mathematics. Nothing of interest operates at equilibrium. Equilibrium is, is, is stasis, it's a kind of death. Right? Everything of interest, whether it's a weather system, a cell, a neuron, a brain, a social network, uh, any pattern operates far from equilibrium. That's why it's interesting. That's why it's able to maintain and cohere over time some pattern of interest. And so, and there is a way to describe this stuff. So it's called evolutionary economics, complex dynamic systems theory. It's just a sort of modern mathematical way of describing the economy. If you view the economy as basically a bunch of individuals or companies transacting, basically buying and selling, writing contracts, whatever it is, out of those individual interactions, just like individual interactions of neurons form a brain, out emerges this huge complex behavior called the global economy. And inherent in that, in that evolution of the economy, inherent is change. First comes the microchip, then comes the computer, then comes the internet, then comes Facebook, then comes a new economic law, the law of increasing returns, which is a whole new economic law. 
So there's nothing like equilibrium here. I mean, there's equilibrium in the price of sugar on a particular day, right? So there's local equilibrium, but the economy as a whole is nowhere near equilibrium. So when you take this view of the economy, which is just really using modern math to describe what is the most complex thing we have, certain kinds of lessons emerge. And the first is that it is inherently unpredictable. The complexity the market demonstrates is so high, is of such a high order, that you cannot, in principle, predict where it is going. That's why you can't pick winners and losers. Second, it's path dependent. What happens first affects what happens later. It can enable something or, or constrain something. First comes the, the, the uh, microchip, then comes Facebook. First comes the dominance of King Coal in the electrical sector. You have entrenched interests and big infrastructure. It inhibits the entry of new technologies like solar. What happens early affects and enables what happens later. It's path dependent. And it's highly complex. That's why it's not bad enough so when you look at those, 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 that way of looking at the economy, you say, well, we can either get swamped by market forces, or we can say, well, if that's true, if that's the way that the economy actually operates, it's not equilibrium, it's this complex, dynamic, evolving thing, how is it that we, that we build structure that enables us to move to a low-carbon state, right? Because again, the, the economy is something we've engineered, right? It's something we've built. And notions like equilibrium are not helpful when we're asking the question, what rules should we change and how to solve our climate problem? What this view of the economy tells us is, if you change the rules at the bottom most level, the most basic rule, then all the complexity that emerges from, that, from those transactions is harnessed. What this view of the economy tells us is, if you change the rules at the bottom most level, the most basic rule, only a price like carbon can do two things at the same time, which seems like a dichotomy, but it's not. First, you harness the market, and you're preventing it from burning every piece of coal in the ground. So you're harnessing it. You're stopping it. At the same time, you're unleashing its creative potential to solve that problem. You're saying to that evolving system, I'm going to give you a constraint to solve for. I don't know how you're going to get there, but solve for it. So you harness the market and unleash it at the same time. It's a fine balance, and that's what a price on carbon does. Right? There's a reason it's so effective, because it acknowledges the market as its fundamentally creative force. So just like in this picture, you can't tell where an individual molecule of water is going to end up. It's too complicated. It's too complex. You can't really tell what patterns will emerge in that water flow. So pretend that's the economy. But you can tell one thing. All that water is going to end up on the bottom of the hill. <laughs> Right? That's what carbon does. It acts like gravity in this picture. And it pulls the economy towards a state. You don't know how it's going to get there. The details are unknowable in principle. But you've unlocked the power of the market to solve in endlessly creative ways that problem. Solve for that constraint. So in other words, I'm saying there is a good body of evidence that pricing carbon is the single most effective tool we have to solve this problem, to unleash market forces in solving this problem. It's not left, it's not right, it's not a political thing. It's simply a very practical way to solve a problem, acknowledging the complexity of the global marketplace. So that's why we change the rules, and that's why the free market defense, right, which is you interfere in the market at your risk, the whole premise of that defense is built on equilibrium. Leave the market alone, that's the only way it's efficient. It's an out of date way of describing the market. So, our little frog you wake up is we need to price carbon. So, the last gasp of the skeptic is to say it, it costs too much. That's all very nice, Tom. You price carbon, it's friction in the system, it, it, that's nice, but it's going to cost me an arm and a leg. And, the, you know, as I, I debate a guy from the Fraser Institute every couple of weeks on Amanda Lang's show. <laughs> And there's nothing like, nothing like climate change and pricing carbon to have the far right worry about the poor. <laughs> right? All those poor people need coal. They need coal. Well, maybe they need solar, but anyway. Um, but, it, but, the, but the point the, the, behind that is the idea that if you increase the cost of energy and you throw a price on carbon, it's economically efficient, it'll cost an arm and a leg, and this, it, 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 it's, it's, it's too much. Your app is too high a price for us to pay. Um, that's, just, that's a position taken by Bjorn Lomborg, it's taken by the American Enterprise Institute, it's taken by the Cato Institute, it's taken by the Fraser Institute. And so I debated Bjorn 
Bjorn Lomborg one day, and I was really looking forward to debating this guy, because I just think he's a, he's a, <laughs> the weird thing is, though, like, you know, he comes to the opposite conclusion than me. My conclusion, I look at all the science and the economics, and I say, all hands on deck, go as fast as we can. Install, install, install. His response is, eh, don't worry so much, there'll be a magic bullet will come along one day and solve this problem. I thought, how can we have such opposite conclusions? So, and he's got very detailed arguments and statistics to back, him up, back himself up, right? If we implemented Kyoto, it would delay the warming of the planet by seven days over 100 years. That's a very accurate thing. <laughs> Uh, it reduced the odds of uh, Category 5 hurricanes by 0.35% by the year 2080. Wow, how do you know, how do you know that? <laughs> so, like any good philosopher, I went to the, to the source. I went, I looked at the economic models that he refers to when he makes these arguments. And these models are used by all the people I've mentioned who talk about action on climate being too expensive, right? Furrowed browed economists use these spreadsheets and churn out numbers and say it's nice that you have these hopes and dreams, kid. <laughs> But in the real world, you know, this is what it's going to cost. It's a bad deal. And so I thought, well, that can't be right. So I looked at the models, and they're, they're called Dice and Rice, a dynamic integrated model of climate and the economy, regionally integrated model on climate and the economy, built by a guy called Nordhaus at Yale. Nordhaus is an honest academic, very smart guy. I recommend his latest book called, uh, I think it's Climate Casino where he, he talks about the economic risks we take with inaction. He's honest about what the models can and cannot do. Right? But they're, they're highly limited. They only work up to about a degree and a half in warming. They're only good out maybe 10 years. You know, he has all these, these caveats to say, you know, ye who enter here, don't use it in the following ways. And then sure enough, everyone uses it in those following ways. He can predict <laughs> things out for 100 years and so on. And so there's ways to improve these models. So, if we're going to build a, a bridge or a hospital, it's common sense to do what's called a cost-benefit analysis, right? You look at what it costs, you look at what the benefits are, and if the benefit out, benefits outweigh the costs, you do the project. And if it doesn't, you don't. So that's pretty common sense. The challenge is, when we're doing a, cost, a standard cost-benefit analysis of something like climate, the models all break down. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about why they break down, because I think they can be improved, but ultimately I think they're speaking the wrong language. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So the first thing that these models do is they dumb the science down. The climate science is a highly complex, non-linear, multiple feedbacks, both positive and negative, and basically it's taken all that science and put it into two linear equations in a spreadsheet. Uh, and again, it only works up to maybe a degree, a degree and a half, because he acknowledges the linearity of those, of those, of those formulas. They don't apply past a certain point. So they've dumped, as, as Lee Smolin at the Permanist who said to me when I was getting exasperated at explaining my frustration at finding this out, this is just before I debated Bjorn, and he said, what's the point of building complex climate models if you're going to plug them into a dumb economic model? <laughs> well, I couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> so it dumbs the science down so much as to be near useless. And one of the reasons, one of the things it does, one of the things that it gets rid of uncertainty, now, uncertainty is not the same as risk. They're different things. One of the only things Donald Rumsfeld ever said that made sense to me <laughs> was the thing he was made most fun of for. He said, there are no knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. <laughs> He's on to something. And what, what bit Rumsfeld in the ass were the unknown unknowns in Iraq, right? The uncertainties. So, risk is a well-known phenomenon. There's a risk my house will burn down. If I want to know what that risk is, I can ask my insurance company. Right? I know roughly the probability of the event, and I know roughly the damage or the outcome of that event. There's a risk I roll cracks in banks with a known probability and a known outcome. Risk is well-behaved. We understand it. Uncertainty is where you don't know the probability of the outcome, or even the outcome itself, and you certainly don't know the repercussions of that outcome. And if you're doing an economic analysis that you need to stick into a spreadsheet, the last thing you want is that really open-ended complexity of uncertainty, because you cannot handle it. And it's where 
The monsters lie in the story, is where the uncertainties are. If I was talking about uncertainties with respect to a nuclear plant, I bet you would get worried. You should. Japan found out about unknown unknowns. There are so many uncertainties when you go from carbon emissions, increase in temperature, local effects of increase in temperature, economic implications of increase in temperature, and so on. Uncertainties cascade through the system and wipe out any hope, any pretense of accuracy. These things are used by Bjorn Lundborg as if they were like a marine sniper where you can put out a matchstick at a mile away when they're more like an 18th century blunderbuss, good at 10 feet. Right? The uncertainties cascade through this thing and they wipe out any quantitative result you could hope to imagine. What's the probability of China's rice crops failing three years in a row at three and a half degrees of warming? I don't know. What are the geopolitical implications of that? I don't know. What are the odds of Pakistan running out of water and holding somebody hostage with their nuclear weapons because they need to feed their people? I don't know. Sounds bad. The uncertainties are where the monsters lie. And if you write the monsters out of the story, as Bjorn Lomborg does, because they're not in his models, of course you don't worry about them. But just because they're not in the model doesn't mean they can't happen. As the financial sector found out, and as Japan found out, and it's recovering, the Fed was there to rescue Wall Street. There's nobody, there's nobody going to be around to rescue us if we get this wrong. The uncertainties are where the monsters lie. Uncertainty needs to be treated with respect. Uncertainty is not a reason not to act. Uncertainty is a reason to act ever more resolutely. So uncertainty is written out of the equation. So I, I almost feel like it's an arbitrary damage function. If you want to you know how much economic damage comes from four degrees, it's an arbitrary linear equation that has no basis in empirical evidence. But again, it's used as if it was accurate 100 years out. So I could go on. I, I won't. Um, you can read the book. <laughs> Um, so they can, so my, my point is, there are reasons these models are inaccurate and not very helpful. And they can be improved. If you criticize something, have a way to improve it. Right? So I have suggestions as to how to improve each of these problems with these models. But ultimately, I think it's the wrong language. One of my favorite um, philosophers of science was a woman called Nancy Cartwright. She was one of my professors at the London School of Economics. And she has a wonderful example where she says, there's someone standing on top of a building in downtown London on a windy day. They hold a piece of paper up about this big above their head and they let it go. Tell me where that piece of paper will land. And everybody committed to a quantitative, right, algorithmic description of the world, which is what these models do, right? And the confidence of numbers and all that kind of stuff. We'll start working out wind shear and gravity and three-dimensional maps of downtown, and we'll have nothing of any use to say to you about where that piece of paper will end up. Why? Because the uncertainties wipe out any possibility of a, of, of a, of a concrete outcome. Right? The system is too complex. Now, a social scientist might say, that looks like a 20-pound note to me. I bet it ends up in somebody's pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so behind that sort of fairly glib example, though, is a, is a deep truth that sometimes, under, under some circumstances, <clears throat> common everyday language is called folk psychology, the way the folk talk to each other, captures truth conditions better than a quantitative, detailed analysis. Her argument is about mind, complexity, and all the rest of it, but it applies here equally well. That sometimes everyday language captures what's going on, captures what's important about the situation in a way that a detailed, quantified approach cannot. So I think when we talk about climate and we use folk psychology, everyday language, and we say, what's the danger of China running out of rice and it being, it, it affecting the rest of the world? I don't know, it sounds really bad. I'm frightened. <laughs> Will we run out of food? I don't know, maybe. How bad does it get? I don't know, pretty bad. And instead of asking the question, how do we optimize our spending such that the benefits we get of saving our ecosystem 
are maximized in the year 2100 using these complicated models, which to dictate our perfect climate policy. <laughs> Maybe we ask the question, where don't we want to go? 450 parts per million has been put out by a lot of people. That's, we don't want to go past that. So instead of doing a cost-benefit analysis of why that's the perfect spot, just say, what does it cost to get there? What's the cost? How much do I have to pay to ensure against that outcome? That's language people understand. And here's the punchline. All of those critics of action, from Bjorn Lomborg to all of them, you know, they, they were rabid when the Stern Report came out. I don't remember the, the Stern Report by Nick Stern. Rabid, frothing at the mouth at how much money was going to get spent rebuilding energy systems to solve this problem. So let's take it at face value, the cost of dealing with this. The benefits are very difficult to calculate, right? That's the, the uncertainty part. What's the benefit of saving China's rice crops in years? I don't know. But the costs are fairly well known. We, we've looked, we have a price on solar. We have a price on wind. We know if batteries are coming down pretty fast. So we kind of have a fairly good sense of the cost of this. So let's pretend, just the sake of argument, there are no benefits. No one makes the solar panels. No one has a job retrofitting buildings. There's no economic upside at all from rebuilding our energy infrastructure from one based on finite resources to one based on technology. There's no benefit, no jobs. We don't, we don't really value the fact that we saved our bread baskets and stopped them from becoming deserts. Ignore all that stuff. That's a worst case scenario, worst case. And I take words from my opponent's mouth, right? At face value, what is the cost? It's about 1% of GDP. That means we double our global wealth in 50 years instead of 46. We delay doubling our wealth by four years. That's what critics of action are so excited about. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. It's a bad deal. Now, it's not going to cost 1% of GDP because someone does build those solar panels. Someone does install them. Someone does retrofit those buildings. There's all kinds of economic upside. I could argue it's a negative cost long term. I argue we're wealthier for doing it, not poorer. But I'm not going to get into a mugs game of cost benefit. I'm throwing all that crap out. Just pure cost to buy the insurance policy, just a check we write every day, buy the insurance policy to stop us at 450 parts per million is 1% of GDP. And if you explain it in those terms, in everyday language, in folk psychology, that climate change is frightening, it's dangerous, it threatens global security, it threatens our food supplies, it will make life very uncomfortable for all of us, and we cannot go there by spending 1% of our GDP. Do you think the public would balk at that? I think not. And if I know what my grandmother would say, went through a war, went through a war in terms of sacrifices that people made to have us here. 1% of GDP is not a sacrifice we're willing to make to ensure the planet. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And if it's explained in that way, I think the public gets it. I think the public gets it. So that's how we wake our frog, we buy climate insurance, and when you translate all that stuff, um, it's about a coffee and a donut per week per person. <laughs> Maybe five donuts because the develop, developing worlds can't afford all that coffee and donuts. So we buy a few extra coffees and donuts for them. That's what we're being asked to sacrifice to ensure the planet. <laughs> and somehow, that's too much, that's too high a price to pay. I know what my grandmother would say to me. <laughs> Sacrifices have been made. So it doesn't cost too much. Climate insurance is a bargain. So I've got to finish with something now. Look, everyone remember, I think it was Apollo 13, the World Watch transfixed while something, I think an oxygen tank blew up. And the astronauts had to fix it out of duct tape and spit or something. And the World Watch absolutely transfixed while they went through this drama and they had to bring this, this spaceship home again. This is our Apollo 13. This, like, there is no other place to go, right? This is it. We stand in the 21st century at a time when there has never been more capital available to us, sloshing around global money markets. There are tens of trillions of dollars of capital sitting on our pension funds and in our money markets. So we know where the capital is. <coughs> we know what policy tools unlock that capital. I just talked about it. It's a price on carbon. And there's a fairly robust argument as to why a price on carbon is the way to go. There are an enormous number of CEOs out there who get it. The fossil fuel industry isn't full of demons. 
They're full of people who supply us energy every day. Some of them are demons, the Koch brothers are demons. <laughs> but most of them are pretty good people, right? Whose hands are tied. BP, I think it was BP and Shell. I think it was those two. Who last year, when they, you know, we talked about we have to leave three quarters of reserves in the ground, they said, please, effectively, I think this is their word, please, put a price on carbon. If you don't, I will burn all that. I have to. Basically, they're asking for help. They need a price on carbon because they know their hands are tied by fiduciary obligations to shareholders. So we know where the capital sits. We know what the policy options are. We're being asked by the best and brightest in the energy sector, with a few exceptions, to do this. We have unprecedented amounts of engineering power around the world, innovation, manufacturing capacity, 20, we sit on the verge of the 21st century, more powerful than we've ever been before. All that stuff I talked about, our world views, where we're innovative, tomorrow's better than today, Francis Bacon, nature is ours to control and stuff. We sit in the 21st century as if that were the case. We, we can solve this problem. We just need to wake up. That's really all we need to do. Because we're not that fraud. Right? We have self-determination. We make the rules by which we live. We understand how our brain works, so we can tell stories to get around this problem. We build our other rules in our economy. The economy is an engineered system, not a natural kind that we find somewhere and we have to leave it alone. We built it. We engineered it. So we know how to solve this problem. We can change and make the rules by which we live unlike that for fraud, because we're humans. And as the existentialists pointed out, that degree of freedom, that by which we have because we're conscious, we make our own values, we make our own world, we make our own rules, is both an opportunity and an obligation. And it is what makes us most human to fill in that gap of freedom with our values. So that's what we need to do. We really just need to wake up. Thank you very much for your time. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce David Reed, from Executive Director of the West Kootenai Eco Society, and he's going to be the moderator for the panel, and he'll introduce the panel members to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, and before we begin with the panel, I just want to uh, thank Michael and Laura and Alan uh, Early, who put a lot of effort into putting this event together, and they deserve a, a big warm round of applause from all of us. <laughs> Mel Reasoner uh, received his PhD from the University of Alberta. Mel directed the Environmental Change Program at Brunel University in London, England, where he also taught courses in weather and climate, climate change, paleoclimatology, and geology. Mel directed an international initiative in Bern, Switzerland, that focused on global change issues in mountain regions worldwide, and became involved in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment as a lead author of a chapter that examines atmospheric conditions and trends in mountain systems. Since moving to the Kootenays, Mel has served on the steering committee for the City of Nelson's Community Energy and Emissions Action Plan and worked with the Columbia Basin Trust's Communities Adapting to Climate Change Initiative. We are very fortunate to have an expert like Mel with us on the panel. Please give him a welcome. Montana Burgess has been involved in environmental and social justice activism from an early age growing up in Kamloops, BC. She holds a Bachelor of Science with a focus on plant ecology from Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. After spending four years in Ottawa working as Outreach Coordinator for Climate Action Network Canada, Montana returned to British Columbia. She currently works as part of an international team as the Operations Manager at Climate Action Network International and has attended over 20 UN climate negotiation sessions and a G20 summit. Montana is a member of the Board of Directors of the West Kootenai Eco Society, is involved in a number of direct action initiatives, and is helping coordinate the West Kootenai community teams of the Dogwood Initiative. We are very fortunate to have Montana with us today. Avery DeVore Smith is studying integrated environmental planning with the School of Environment and Geomatics at Selkirk College. She is passionate about the environment and the community. Her previous education was international relations with a minor in women's studies. 
Avery recently joined the local chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. She is here to represent the voice of young people in this panel, and yes, we are very fortunate to have her with us. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Fiona Galbraith is an environmental consultant working primarily with local and provincial level governments on climate change. Since 2010, Fiona has been contracted by the City of Nelson to design and implement the Corporate Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan, which has achieved a 20% reduction in corporate emissions. Fiona is also involved in the city's district energy project, solar community garden, and EcoSafe home energy retrofits program. She sits on the board of directors for the West Kootenai Eco Society and volunteers her time with the society's climate change committee. We're very fortunate to have her with us. So we thought we'd start by offering each of our panelists uh, an opportunity to simply react with any questions or comments that they may have uh, after Tom's very stirring speech. So uh, anyone, would, would anyone like to volunteer to go first or shall I call on someone? <laughs> okay, Mel, you're, you're up. I was just thinking in the intermission there that I, I think I started giving public presentations about climate change in about 1992, so that was more than 20 years ago, and, and during that period of time I've been somewhat distressed by the way things played out. Um, the scientific community did, a, a, in retrospect, a pretty bad job of, of, of stating their position and getting the message across, and it did really turn into a media street fight, and, and we kind of lost a lot of the time. Um, and it, it personally bothered me that, that um, honest climate change science, scientists could be so, so vilified in, in the media. Um, and, um, but I think, you know, we were talking about Dr. Spock and, and Captain Kirk, so I'm sort of a Dr. Spock defender. I would like, I kind of would like to see Dr. Spock as, I don't know, Prime Minister, for example. Um, but I, I believe, and I, I, I believe 20 years ago, that if people understood the science, they would be compelled to take some action. And clearly that hasn't worked out very well. The scientific community hasn't done a great job, but... I think it's improving, and I've been working on this sort of thing with CBT for quite a few years now. And, and locally, we're starting, to, we're starting to gain some traction. Um, but, you know, we're talking about uncertainty. Uh, you often hear uncertainty mentioned as a reason, the, the uncertainty in the science mentioned as a reason to not act. But something that's usually forgotten is that there's two sides to the uncertainty. There's the uncertainty, oh, it might not be so bad, but, you know, the four to six degrees Celsius projection of, of, of climate change with the current emissions path that we're on, it could be worse than that. Um, it's something that we have to bear in mind. The uncertainty monster cuts both ways. And uh, the Earth's climate system is, is full of, of tipping points. This is something that gets kind of scary when you look at past climate change. The, the ability of the Earth's climate to flip from one state to another, it's demonstrated that in the past, and there's concern that we might, we might reach that again. Tonight, I'm probably more optimistic, after listening to Tom's talk and reading his book, more optimistic than I've been in a long time, 20 years, maybe. And, and, and partly, um, I think it's, it's, it's because there's, you know, Tom has sort of underscored for me that perhaps we're approaching not a, a tipping point in the climate system, but we might be a approaching a, tip a tipping point in the human structures that are preventing us from moving forward. And um, I kind of think to technolo technological changes like vinyl. In 1978, everybody in the music business thought vinyl was there forever, and in a couple of years, whammo, we had CDs. And I get the impression from what Tom is saying that my gut feeling is that perhaps we're approaching that point. And um, so I guess my question to Tom is, do you think that's a reasonable position? Do you agree? Um, let's just say we were. Um, uh, and that technology, when you look at your car mirror and it says objects are closer than they appear, I think that is what clean tech is. And I think energy incumbents in this country in particular had better watch out. Right? I mean, I think that stuff is coming really fast. Um, so I think the answer is, the answer is yes. But I, I, would, I would put it back to you and say, um, so what? Uh, uh, there's the, the levels of uncertainty that we're beginning to approach in the climate system uh, might indicate that, that we're going to face something anyway. Something, climate change, we're going to avoid it. We're just trying to make it less bad. 
So let's just say yes, it's coming really fast. Um, solar is going to be three and a half cents a kilowatt hour in many jurisdictions within 12 to 18 months. Utilities will be disrupted. I mean, in, in Europe, you saw Eon, big, big European uh, utility, abandon its coal and nuclear assets essentially and say those are going to be yield co. Uh, they're just going to sort of have a lifetime. They'll last X number of years and they're not going to be renewed. And they're getting into uh, trying to understand how a utility uh, becomes a service oriented. Um, company, right? So distributed generation, uh, demand response. We talked earlier about why would a utility really be uh, motivated to sell less energy? Well, Eon is trying to figure that out. And one of the ways they're going to do that is they're going to they're going to try to build value with customers. And so if they have a, a, a big industrial user, they're going to say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be the, the company that gives you real time circuit by circuit measurements of all your energy use. I'm going to have the ability to continuously commission your equipment so when it goes off spec, you'll know about it. And you're going to own and take responsibility for energy use the way you've never been able to do it before. And I, the utility, are going, to, are going to help you do that. So you'll buy less power from me, but you're going to buy a lot of data from me. So I think those are all signs that the acceleration of technology in this space is happening very, very quickly. I think incumbents need to watch out. I think, uh, you know, if you're a, a vinyl manufacturer, <laughs> the equivalent thereof, three years later, you, 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 better, you better be in the CD business. <laughs> um, but I put back to you, is it okay to say all that's happening? Um, do you think we're going to be able to stop at 450? And if we do stop at 450, what does that translate to in your mind in terms of, of what uncertainties have we held in check? Give me an optimistic answer. I don't, I don't mean to, I don't mean to, to tell me how bad it is. Which, which of those monsters can we not worry about so much? What, what kinds of tipping points are we going to avoid if we stop at 450? Which we could do. Well, to put it in perspective, the, the, the geologic perspective, which I think you don't have to go very far back in geologic time, only 20,000 years, uh, to the height of the last glacial period. We were under a, a kilometer of ice here. It was a completely different world. And the amount of temperature change globally that we're talking about between ice age and and our interglacial period is about six degrees Celsius. The thing is, <laughs> we're going the other direction, and that's where the unknowns really uh, right. lie. Uh, it's that magnitude of change, um, enormous change. There's a famous paleoclimatologist, uh, his name's Wally Broker. He's still around, he's very old, but he was one of the originals who was working on radiocarbon dating in the 50s, so he's, he's been around a long time. And he's, he referred to the, the climate system, the Earth's climate system, as an angry beast, and we are poking it with a big stick. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's a, a, a pretty good description. Um, I, I'm, I don't know. I Just in this last year, there were two papers that came out um, that have pretty much determined that the West Antarctic ice sheet is now past the tipping point. It will end up in the ocean. It will raise sea level by three meters. But we can't go back. It's, that's going to happen. And it'll take 200 years to play out, but 200 years for a coastal city that's been there for 3,000 is going to be a problem, <laughs> or any coastal city. There are some things that we can't get back. Uh, we are going to have to adapt to um, the changes that are coming, and, and we need to, to try to put a lot of effort into anticipating what those changes are going to be, and the steps that we can take to, to limit the damage. But there are, unfortunately, in the climate system, these unknown unknowns. <laughs> and and uh, there are some scary, some scary things to think about with the positive feedback loops that are embedded in the system. Um, so we are, on, we are on a path to, um, to at least two degrees Celsius. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, and when you look at what's happened in this region over the last 100 years, we've warmed up about 1.6 degrees Celsius over the last 100 years in the Nelson area. And that's pretty, pretty standard around the Columbia Basin. It's pretty much double what the globe has done. And there's no reason for us to think that that's going to change in the future. So locally, um, even with you know, an additional 4 degrees warming um, by the end of the century in this part of the world, because we're closer to the Arctic amplification. Um, so, I don't know. I, I, now I'm slipping back into my pessimistic mode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did that Mel, all I want to know is if I grow cantaloupe. Yeah, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> well, I'm not pessimistic. But I do want to talk about something really uncomfortable. And as um, Tom mentioned in his presentation, which was very great, thank you, um, he talked about how we want to avoid discomfort. 
And unfortunately, we need to get really uncomfortable if we want to be serious about climate change or really taking any social, um, social problems seriously. And I say social because climate change affects us as humans and our societies, and that's kind of where most of the concern tends to go to, although nature and the intrinsic value is also very important. Um, so during the presentation, you probably were going, okay, so this is what the tech folks are gonna do, and this is what the markets need to do, and we need to get a price on carbon, but what can I do about that? I'm a person, I live in the Kootenays, and this all sounds like I'm kind of powerless in it. So I wanted to just briefly talk about some things I think we can all do, and I would love the panel and Tom to be able to give their input also on what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. So, firstly, we have all sorts of things we can do personally, and yeah, we can change light bulbs, and that's important, and we can drive less, that's important, but we can, we can take serious action with our money. I don't need to tell Nelson and the West Kootenays about how to buy local, and how to, you know, review the products you're buying, and, you know, buy the chickens from your neighbors to eat, and all that kind of thing. But lots of us invest money. We are investors. We buy RSPs, we pay money into things for the future, and... As far as I know, in my conversations with investors in Canada around RSPs and such, it's really difficult to invest your money and not have it go to fossil fuels. Indirectly, directly, it's very, very difficult. It's probably possible somewhere, but not in the conversations I've ever had with any financial institution. So there's a divestment movement sweeping across North America around universities that are divesting from fossil fuels on an institutional level, which is incredibly powerful. None have been in Canada yet, but there are student movements and faculty movements working to make that happen. Um, same with hospitals and other institutions in the US. This is starting to happen. So you can start to talk about divestment and where you want to put your money and how to invest in clean energy and how to make investments that are sustainable for our future. Um, it's also, it's, so it's having those conversations with yourself and then with your neighbors. And where are you going to do that? You're going to do that at your places of worship, at your office, at your schools, um, at your knitting circles, when you're having beers in the garage fixing a car, you know, with your neighbors. It's those peer conversations, like Tom mentioned, that really are going to start to change how we think as a society and where we take action, where we put money on a day-to-day -day level. And then... It's also demanding that our local officials come up with climate action plans and create policies and implement them in the proper way so the industry and the business can be regulated, like Tom was talking about, with the CEO, CEOs and their hands tied. We need to untie their hands, so we need those regulations, we need the law to change, and we need our politicians who have the power to do that, to do that. And the only way we're gonna do it is if we demand it. So how do we demand it? This is the uncomfortable part. We're really uncomfortable. We can talk to our politicians, but as you know, our politicians from some parties don't really listen because their boss calls the shots. So what do we do then? We are forced, I believe, to consider civil disobedience in Canada, which we haven't had to do for a while, but it is in our tradition, in our history of doing. And so what is civil, dis civil disobedience? It's a whole bunch of different stuff. It's taking to the streets in the form of rallies and protests, it's letter writing campaigns to your MP, which are very traditional, you know, not scary ways to start getting involved. But basically climate change, it's gonna affect us in a really meaningful way. So we need to meaningfully engage and get uncomfortable, I think, in order to make a real stand and change the future that Tom outlines we can totally have if we fight for it. <laughs> topics. One, uh, what individuals can do. Uh, we got a topic here about uh, investment and divestment, and there's a topic of civil disobedience. Can uh, is there a is there a, a, a polite Canadian bone that's ready to go beyond the letter writing campaign? Looks like Avery's ready to jump in. Hi. So first of all, I just really want to thank all the young people who are here, which isn't very many. <laughs> But those of you who did come out, I know some people have exams tomorrow and work and whatever. It's really awesome that you're here because I think that's really important. We were talking about at dinner what the age criteria is now for youth, and apparently it's under 35. So if you're under 35, you're youth. That's great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> apparently by the time I'm 40, maybe I'll still be youth, so that's exciting. <laughs> I just want to tell you guys really quickly about an exciting project that's coming to Nelson. 
specifically for youth. It's called Groundswell and it's an alternative grassroots economic school. And it's basically about helping young people get the tools, the education, the means that they need to create a business in a small town, in a community that is sustainable for the environment, that's sustainable for the local social economy. And if this is something that you know someone who might be interested in, who's starting up, wants to start up their own business, check out Columbia Basin Groundswell on Facebook or on the internet. Google. But uh, mostly I kind of want to talk about what Montana was saying because I totally agree with her. And my question and my comment is, how do we get the youth involved? You know, the last election, I think it was just under 30% of young people voted and we are the future and I really don't think that's enough. So what do we do? And I'm a positive, polite Canadian thinker who wants to take action now and make positive change. And you know, people might laugh at me sometimes for that, but. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of ask Tom what he thinks the youth can do because I don't know if you guys know, but he puts on these great webinars for young people. And it's such an amazing tool to learn about climate speak and how you can implement change and deal with your local politicians and be a little more radical and you know do something important that's really gonna make a difference. So you know, what is the answer? Is it political? Is that how the youth get involved and make a difference? Well, I'm not youth. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's, I think that's a really good question. I, I don't, I, I don't know how you get youth more involved. I think you know that better than I do. And I think you know your examples of youth getting involved and, and the ongoing struggle of having people to engage uh, is 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 a meaningful question that I don't have a simple answer for. Um, but um, it's really, really hard to ignore youth when they're able to articulate their fears, uh, their worries. Um, and I, I, one of the things I've done in, in Toronto is I've, I've given talks to some high schools, uh, and there's nothing more powerful than when you get that room full of five or six hundred kids standing on their feet and yelling because what you've done is, and I, what I, I like to say to them, you have intuitions about whether or not adults are taking care of business, and you're worried that we're not because you know. Climate change is coming. You probably think it's really bad, but you're not entirely sure, and you're worried that maybe someone isn't isn't watching the wheelhouse in the boat, right? That maybe no one's actually looking after business. And I and I said, your intuitions are right. We're not looking after business. Your deepest fears are correct. And when I said that, a bunch of them got on their feet and started yelling. They were they were really really <coughs> happy. Happy might be the right word to have someone <laughs> say to them honestly. You're right, we're not looking after business. All those intuitions you have are correct. Now, the question is, what do you do about that now? I think the first thing you do is acknowledge it, and let's stop pretending that we're taking care of business. We're not taking care of business. We're headed to some very, very dark places. And just now, we sort of had this moment, you and I, where I brought you to this dark place, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm gonna get so pessimistic again. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's not polite to be pessimistic. It's not polite to talk about how bad this is. But we keep avoiding the issue. I think two degrees in the rearview mirror. I think we'll be lucky to stop at three. You know, that doesn't mean you don't do something. You still stop, you still mitigate, you still mitigate, 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 mitigate. But I think one, one thing that young people need to hear from us is that we have screwed it up, right? That we are relying on you. And there's nothing more powerful than an articulate young person voicing those fears, right? Which are often inarticulate because they're young and it's, it's, it's hard to talk publicly and so on. And you guys are very brave to do what you do. And there was that one speech at the UN where this, I think it was a Canadian, and you think you know her. And she said, you've been negotiating all my life, right? And that video brought me to tears, you know? It is really difficult to ignore young people when they're in your face. So when you talk about civil disobedience and public engagement, I absolutely and totally endorse young people physically getting in people's faces and saying, we have a problem, and you're not taking care of business. That means walking up to, to Stephen Harper's office and sitting down on the floor and saying, I'm not going to leave until he hears me. Hats off to you, because that's what it's going to take. And I think that happens only when there's an honest conversation about how bad this has gotten, that we go to these dark places and admit that, you know, we're not going to stop at two degrees. Let's not pretend we're going to stop at two degrees. Let's not pretend the sacrifices we have to make now are trivial sacrifices. They're not, because it's too late. We're 20 years late. So. I think young people understand this. I was at a, at a pub late at night, and the kid asked me what I did. 
he was a musician, and I, and I told him, I said, I wrote this book about climate. And the first thing he said to me was, isn't it too late? <laughs> and I was several drinks in, and I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> Where do you go from there? <laughs> but that conversation right there is the conversation we're not having, right? And just because you're too late to stop at two doesn't mean you're too late to stop at three. Doesn't mean you don't get all hands on deck to mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. But I think the danger is that, that young people just aren't able to have that open, honest connection where someone says to them, you're right. It is as bad as your intuitions are telling you. And we screwed it up. Help us. And I think when you do that, you open up, a you open up some possibility for action. Because now they're empowered to say, I am going to get in some space about this. I don't have to be nervous about whether this is, is as important as I think it is. I'm not making it up. It is that important. I am justified in getting into some mistakes about this. And I think that's where you really empower young people. But I'm not a young person, so why Let's, <laughs> let's uh, move from the young person perspective to the old person's perspective that Montana brought up about investing money. Uh, Tom, you might have some insight around this, around right. the divestment movement. Uh, and then the, the question from the audience was about, if I wanted to invest in clean tech, what do I do? Um, so this is a much more constructive answer. That was a very early, early thing, but I think it was very important. And I, and I, and I, I think it's honest that you have those kinds of conversations. They're difficult. But there's no answer at the end. On the investment side, I have something much more precise to say, um, which is in England, there's a, a very strong movement um, you own pension funds, right? In Canada, OMER is one of the biggest pension funds on the planet. It's owned by its members, which is the Ontario Municipal's employees or something. Um, we own our pensions. They're ours. The problem is we don't have a direct line of communication uh, with those who make decisions on investing that money. When money managers on Bay Street and Wall Street and in the city of London make decisions about investing money, uh, they have a pretty standard set of, of boxes they tick about IRR, project risk and off-take party risk and on and on all the way down, nowhere on that list is uh, climate risk. Uh, and yet, it's, yet it's, it's, it's your money. It's our money. And so there's an effort to, to open up communication between broad groups of pension fund holders. So that can be large groups who contribute to a single pension fund, or it can be a whole bunch of individuals um, who articulate to the money managers that they don't want to take uh, carbon risk. They don't want to invest in fossil fuels. They will accept a slightly lower rate of return if that meant that they were doing something good. Um, and having communicated that stuff, there's suddenly a fiduciary obligation on behalf of the fund manager to take that into account. As long as it's not communicated, there is no obligation. And so that's kind of how people try to crack open the big pension funds, is you actually open a path of communication between the, the pension fund holders, the citizenry, through the, the investment managers to, the, to, the, to their bosses, essentially. And sort of shortcut that sort of easy, uh, do what I did yesterday kind of mentality, which is what most money managers do, right? They simply cookie cut what they did yesterday. That's how it works. It's very conservative. And once you open that line of communication up, there is suddenly an obligation for those pension funds to take into account things like climate risk. And I think that's one way to, to sort of engage in those big pieces of capital. And there are groups trying to do that in Canada. I can't remember the name right now. Julia Langer of the Toronto Atmospheric Fund is spearheading it. Mercer's is looking at it. Anyway, that's one way to do it, is to, is to acknowledge that that money is owned <coughs> by the pension fund beneficiaries. And there's no point having a, a, bene a, a benefit being paid to you in 50 years, 30 years, if we've destroyed the planet. And, and I think that's, what, that's where sort of citizen power can, can be expressed, is enforcing a fiduciary obligation from the money managers by articulating what their values are. And there's also the, the um, divestment campaign, campaigns around um, endowments. Uh, the United Church, I know, is going through a process now looking at their endowment. Uh, there are other universities, et cetera, that are looking at endowments. The Rockefeller Foundation just announced they're taking all their money out of oil. It's completely ironic. Um, so if you're taking your money out of that, right, and even as an individual investor, as Montana said, it's hard to find sometimes um, investments that you can feel confident about when it comes to uh, the, our climate future. So how do you find those those climate investments? And Fiona, that's a softball for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, one, certainly one local example that came up in terms of investments in renewable energy, the city of Nelson and Nelson Hydro is looking at a community solar garden. This will be a centralized solar array that community members can buy into if you rent your house, if you have a roof that doesn't 
much sun exposure, you could actually buy a piece of this array. And so your renewable energy would then get fed back into the grid and you can purchase or you get a credit for that on your Nelson Hydro bill. So that's certainly a very local example of something that we're still in the feasibility kind of exploration stage, but hoping to bring that to the table for people who live in Nelson. I actually did have um, a couple of things. I just want to go back a little bit to your experience, Tom, with the students who felt so validated when you right. said, yeah, you have a reason to be scared. Right. And it's interesting because we actually have a local community mediation group here in town. And one of the things I've trained as a volunteer mediator, one of the things you learn is how important it is for someone to be heard, for someone to actually acknowledge and say, yes, I hear your fears, and that's important, right? Like, that's kind of the first step. I have no idea how you take your experience, you know, with a handful of students and expand that to a much larger group where they actually do feel heard, but I think that's a huge piece of, of that puzzle for sure. Um, another question that I had for you, though, I wanted to kind of come back to part of this clean tech. I mean, Nelson Hydro and the city of Nelson is looking at the solar garden, we're looking at a biomass-based bio district energy system that would provide heat to the downtown core. Um, there's the home energy retrofit program. Like they are trying, you know, to go down these roads, and I would love to, which I think is a fantastic start. And I would like to see more of that happen. The thing that you bump up against, of course, is business case. How do you make solar pay off? People are going to have to pay more for their energy if they want to buy into the solar. Which we've got a great community here. That <laughs> lots of people are willing to do that. So they're asking them to pay more. Or, for instance, with biomass, like the price of natural gas, even with $1.50 per gigajoule carbon tax on top of the, which we have in BC, it's still not enough to make biomass truly competitive. So I guess going back to your kind of tech background, um, a couple questions would be, A, do you see any opportunities for a community like Nelson to really expand on some of these renewable energies? And, or if it's sort of on the horizon, like you said, maybe we're on this exponential curve, is there a way that we can get ready for it? that we can, you know, are there regulations in place that need to come down or things that need to change or really be, be there? Right, yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so first of all, prices, the price of clean tech goes in one direction, which is down, um, mainly because it's a technology-driven energy source, right? Moore's Law, computers, microchips, cost goes in one direction because innovation always brings cost down. Now, we recently saw in North America a fracking revolution which brought the price of oil uh, it, was, it was the American um, uh, shale oil that brought the price of oil down to $50, not the Saudis. Um, and a few years previous, it brought the price of natural gas down enormously. Um, so we have a temporary, I think, aberration in the long-term price direction of a finite resource, which is up. The challenge is, how is it that you respond in the short and medium term uh, in the absence of those long-term price signals? Again, I think, I think clearly one will always go down and one will always go up but you have these very localized um, variances. Uh, in terms of, that, so, that, so that's a problem. And I, and I don't, there's no easy answer for it. Uh, one, I can just say price carbon, and then suddenly fossil fuels become more expensive, which makes biomass look better. But, you know, that, that's, not, that's, that's sort of a, a trivial answer. Um, at the end of the day, projects that generate energy that don't require an input, like right, all renewable projects, um, only, they rely on one thing mainly for the, price of the energy, which is the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think a solution is, uh, I, I, it's called green bonds. Green bonds are a government-backed bond. So essentially, the government is lending its risk rate to projects that are renewable. And if you lower the cost of capital for renewable energy projects, you lower the cost of that renewable energy, because most of it is the amortization of debt on those projects. So I don't know whether the municipality of Nelson has the ability to issue a bond. I don't know what your credit rating is. Um, but BC has a credit rating. Um, so I, I actually think the job, what's going to happen in Ottawa is they've already, they've already forfeited their ability to set up the carbon regime. Provinces have moved ahead without them. They have no choice. Ontario is going to price carbon later this year. They're going to do it carbon cap and trade. So Justin or somebody else will win the next election. It won't be Stephen Harper. And they will be... They will, uh, they will. Tom or Justin, somebody like that will win the election. Um, or they'll get together and form a, form a coalition government. Yeah. Getting far too far. Um, the role of the federal government, I think, at that point is to say, you know, we have the ability, the federal government, we have the lowest risk rate of any jurisdiction in the country. Our money is essentially free to us, 
And I think what they should be doing is setting up a giant pot of very, very low cost capital that municipalities, local utilities, provinces fight over, essentially by bringing forward projects that, have, that are renewable in, in that, that produce renewable energy. And they compete for the money by simply making the project robust, having you know, so all the due diligence stuff you normally require. But if you can lower the cost of capital, then you lower the cost of all of those kinds of, of resources. The problem, with the exception of biomass, you've got to get the money biomass, so you may be stuck there. But I think that's the role of the federal government in enabling and underwriting the ability of local jurisdictions to solve this problem, because all action is local. And I think that's how you, that's how you solve the problem. Um, and ultimately, you can engage citizenry, because green bonds could be things that we buy as citizens, like a Canada Savings Bond, right? That we go to our bank and we buy $1,000 of green bond, it's underwritten by the federal government. And by the way, for the, for the accounting geeks in the crowd, uh, the, you can set up green bonds where it's not just government debt, right? It's not just a bond the government now owes money and it's just more debt. You can set it up where it's an off the balance sheet contingent liability because all of the projects that are being built with that money are hard assets, right? It's not like you just spent the money on, on education, which is a soft asset, but an asset is a soft asset. You can't sell it. They're hard assets. And so the ability of the federal government to generate and leverage enormous amounts of money and make it available at extremely low interest rates uh, is, is easily done without increasing the national debt because the hard assets back that bond. And the only difference between the, the, the liability, the amount of money that it would cost the government is measured as the difference between the interest rate you could get from that project if you went to the bank by yourself and what the government's going to provide it for. And that spread is only ever six, seven, maybe eight percent, which means that only six, seven, or eight percent of those loans are ever going to default. So it is not an issue of whether the government can borrow money or whether we're just going more into debt. All the government is doing is lending their risk rates for projects that we have decided are of strategic national importance, which is a renewable energy distributed grid. And that's how I think you solve those problems. So Nelson, go tap on that box and get a few million dollars, build the system. From the energy you produce, you make the interest payments, which are minimum. And and that's, that's, I think, having you kicking in here, too. So you, uh, speaking of things that are easier said than done, um, you <laughs> talked, about, <laughs> talked about changing the rules, and uh, the carbon price was one way of changing the rules. But uh, for the panel at large, how are we going to change the rules when it comes to uh, big capital when it comes to the political system, when it comes to the way that uh, people think about uh, their relationship to uh, consumption or the environment. How do, we, how do we change the rules in all those important ways? <laughs> well, my view. We have to get really, really organized us in this room, in our communities, and we have to start here. We can't expect someone else is going to solve it for us. We have to come together, we have to put in the hard work and mobilize as one community, as one people, towards common goals. We have to develop a common vision of what we want. We all know we have a common vision. We live in the Kootenays for a reason. We love the Kootenays for a reason. And most of us have chosen to move here because it's so great. So we, we take that common vision and we make it a reality with hard work with coordination and do it as civil society. You know, so you need to make these changes in government. And while we're working on the federal government, which is, you know, there's only so much we can do here. We have control of our riding and there are ridings around us through our friends and peers, but that's about it. But while we're doing that, you know, we have this great municipal government and we can challenge them to go further. And we're very creative. And we know how to solve problems as a community. So we can challenge them to go further and have a 100% renewable goal for the city of Nelson. And when the federal government is able to issue these green bonds, which sound awesome, which we have to pressure them to do also, then we can move forward with that. So there's lots of ways, and this ties back to young people, like how do we get involved? How do we do this? You find what resonates with you and you go for it. You totally go for it. You commit to volunteering for something you care about or work for it. And um, only through like coordinated responses, strong together, can we make changes from this room, I think. Yeah, it's really great, Montana, about 
getting organized and sort of doing things. And I find it's a lot easier to do things in your own backyard. When I think about trying to affect federal politics, it's, that's huge. <laughs> I'm not, I have no idea how, you know, I can do my letter writing and I can do all the other things, which I, you know, they are important, but. Um, okay. And voting, yes. <laughs> and I do do that as well. But I feel like when I work, I used to work for the province of Ontario as a policy analyst, and I never even saw half the things that I worked on. Whereas here in Nelson, I get to see, you know, hopefully a district energy system being built and the solar garden going up and all of these various projects happening. And I think that Nelson can be a great example of how it can be done. We can make a change at the municipal level with our municipal government and say this is what we want. And there are ways to do that, certainly, like I said, buying into solar and various other options that you've got here. But yeah, that's huge in terms of being an example. Be able to hold that up as an example of how it can be done. So if I, if I could draw an analogy that may not make sense at first, and I hope I can pull it together. Um, I play hockey on a hockey team, a bunch of good old boys. I like them very much. Uh, we play hockey, we go and drink beer and eat chicken wings. And these are, these are sort of rough and tumble guys who, uh, some of them, at the beginning of when we joined this team, my friend John and I thought it was okay in the dressing room, make gay jokes. And it's not. And they hadn't yet learned, and they hadn't been exposed to the social pressure someone saying, what? What did you just say, dude? Um, young people get it, right? So something happened in the national conversation where it was suddenly not okay to be homophobic. Uh, and how did that happen? It happened because people began to have conversations about it. And it became a social more. Uh, same thing happened with fur back in the 80s. It suddenly wasn't cool to wear fur. I don't know if that had the quite the legs that the equal rights agenda did. But, but that's what's going to happen on, on carbon. It will eventually be considered rude to overuse energy and so on. And, it, and, and that conversation isn't happening anywhere except in rooms like this, right? That I, our business leaders, because they have a brand behind them, aren't able to talk turkey about climate, right? Um, because the brand doesn't want to be associated with negative thoughts and dark places and all that kind of stuff. Jeff Rubin had to quit CIBC to write the book about peak oil, because CIBC did not want to be associated with it. So I think, uh, it sounds trivial, but conversations matter, right? That's how it became socially inappropriate to make gay jokes in a hockey locker room, because there were conversations happening every day in neighborhoods, in doctor's offices, at the pub, between kids and parents, between teachers and parents, between teachers and kids, that it just became not okay anymore. My point is that conversations matter. And suddenly it becomes normal to want action on climate. Suddenly it becomes normal to care about carbon. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer appropriate to write in your paper that you feel climate isn't happening or that it's not important or whatever. So I think social norms happen because of conversations. I, I, I don't think you can overstate the importance of taking the conversation that we've had in this room. You may not agree with all of it, of course. But to take it into your daily, to, to take it to your workplace, to take it to your local bar, take it to the coffee shop, take it to the family dinner table, because that's when, that's how social norms become. That's how they evolve. They, they evolve through conversations. So, really quickly, and those conversations are really uncomfortable. <laughs> so you got to get uncomfortable to make this a reality. Sorry, I just have very one very quick addition as well. It's a plug. It's such a good segue. Um, the Eco Society runs conversation cafes, <laughs> which some of you may or may not have attended. But they are excellent events, and there is one happening next Wednesday, the April 8th, and it's going to be about Solar Garden. So, if you're interested in learning more about that, come out to Expressions. It's at Expressions? No. Oh, so. <laughs> it's at Oso at next week. So feel free to come on out and keep an eye out for the other conversation cafes, because they're really great events. Yeah, there's two things come to mind. Um, one is sort of loosely around knowledge. How people change their views when when they are empowered by knowledge, and the other things around money. So regarding the knowledge piece, what has been happening for the last 20 years is in the media, the the, the message coming from the scientific community has been incredibly badly distorted, and the real story has not been getting out to people. And in my simple my simplistic view of the way the world works, is that politicians will only really respond to something if it becomes something that the people are demanding. And if the media is in the middle of this, distorting the message from the scientific community, then the message is not going to be coming from the people to the politicians, and we end up being stuck. We end up being the frogs in the pot. So one thing that, that we can do 
Um, I think it's starting to slowly change a bit. Some of the, some newspapers and, and I just saw just a couple days ago, ago that Google was going to start to rank Google pages, web pages, not just by the number of hits, but by the by the validity of their of, of their information, which would be a really good step. And of course, the, the websites that deny climate change are screaming mad about that because most of what they have on their websites is BS. But something that we can do is is engage in the conversation in things like newspapers. You can write letters to the editor, you can get involved. Um, and there are places where you can get the information, not uh, necessarily, uh, university libraries are great, but we don't have one in Nelson, but there are websites where they refer back to the scientific literature and, and have a lot of good information. Real climate and skeptical science come to mind. So I would encourage people of all ages, young and old, to get involved in the discussion in the media. And I think that that may eventually, hopefully, start to drive some action among politicians. The second bit is that we respond to cost, and I think the, this is the idea of a carbon tax. If, it's, if the bad things cost more and the good things cost less, that makes sense that people will start <clears throat> uh, to avoid the bad things. One of the things that I just saw in the International Energy Agency's World Energy Report of uh, 2014 is that currently fossil fuel industries are subsidized to the tune globally of $550 billion a year. And, and you're saying that we're almost on parity in some cases, even with that imbalance in the subsidies. One of the biggest subsidies that the fossil fuel sector gets that we don't talk about is the need for standing armies and the need to wage wars in the Mideast, yeah. right? That's, that's a cost, that's a cost that's a, at a human cost, and it's a financial cost. And I don't think anybody's under any illusions as to why there's such a military presence there, right? Um, so that, that's, that's in addition to the $550 million of direct subsidies that fossil fuels get. Um, so I think if you, if you even the playing field, to go back to your original question, <laughs> if you even the playing field, right? So right now we're trying to say, I want to put a cost on carbon, which will make fossil fuels more expensive, which would make renewables look better, right? It's ultimately going to be, but you're embedding a cost into the system. I talked about how little that cost actually is, but you're adding a cost. What we already have is a massive cost in the system. Oh, your microphone's off. Oh. You're being censored. It was a military industrial complex. <laughs> um, that there's an enormous cost already implicit in fossil fuels that we're, that, that we're not paying for. We're paying for it through taxes, and Americans in particular are paying a lot of taxes to keep those supply chains open. And that's part of, the, of a conversation that's also very awkward, right? That that's the reason, you know, we went to war. The Western world's at war in the Mideast because of oil. And so again, those are, those, are, those are, if you tilt the playing field and you eliminate those from the system, renewables compete. Like, renewables are treated often like they're the kids' table at the dinner party, right? Where there's lots of enthusiasm and sound and fury, but not a lot of substance. The kids are all grown up. It is absolutely feasible that renewables can power our civilization and do it at lower cost than fossil fuels. What we need is access to cheap debt, because that's what the oil guys already have, and what we need is scale. That's all that's required. It's not a question of can we run the world without fossil fuels. The question is, can we make the transition quickly enough to avoid some of these more catastrophic uh, uh, levels of warming? Mm. The kids, the, the, the adults at the dinner table, it's like they're loaded and can't get us home properly. The kids are all grown up, we're ready to step up, clean tech can play, clean tech, there's no reason our factories have to shut down if our, if our economy is running clean tech. I would urge you to uh, look up that Mark Jacobson guy out of, out of Stanford, who's got a pretty detailed breakdown by region in terms of what resources are there, what will it cost, given some assumptions around what, what can I get capital for? Uh, and he's got a 20-year plan to get the United States off fossil fuels entirely. And it is absolutely credible, it is articulated, it is quantified, so we know the cost, the trajectory. And that's, that's what a lot of assumptions on cost dropping, which they're going to continue to do. Um, so that's without even taking into account these massive subsidies that for generations we've put up with because we felt like we had to, which is standing militaries to protect oil mines. Um, take all that into account, clean tech is a bargain. Uh, it is easily capable of powering our civilization. It's a question only of moving capital quickly and building that infrastructure quickly. And that's where things like green bonds will so come in. And green bonds happen because citizens have demanded. So speaking of... Uh Um, I just want to speak for probably a lot of the youth and probably a lot of the adults too when we hear all these things and we just think, oh my god, this is so overwhelming. And 
where do I start? And this is too much information. And you know, I agree with you guys all, and I think everyone agrees. But you know, where do you start as an individual to really, you know, incorporate all these things? And I think I agree with what everyone is saying, Montana and. Um, Fiona, thank you so much for bringing those points forward. You know, we need to come together as a community, but let's start as individuals. And, you know, if you really do care and you really are passionate, there are very easy things you can do to make simple little changes in your own individual life. Choose one thing that you really care about and dedicate some more time to it, you know. Choose that one thing that is really going to make you become passionate. You're going to want to share it with your friends and your family, and it's going to inspire other people around you because some of these things are so overwhelming. And I speak as a young person, and I want to implement all these changes, and I want to invest, and I want to buy green bonds, and I want to be great and awesome and help the environment and the world. And it's so overwhelming. <laughs> so I just like I just want to make sure everyone really knows that you know you can make a difference as an individual, and it's going to affect your whole community and it's gonna, in turn, affect your country, and that's so important, and I really think you just, you, the one really easy thing we can do is to vote. Everyone can do that, and don't forget. <laughs> uh, in fact, we've started a Facebook group called Kootenai's Vote for Climate Action, and we've got little pieces of paper up at the top at the Eco Society booth and the Citizens Climate Lobby booth to remind you to go sign up on that Facebook page, and, and that'll give us an opportunity to get in touch with you during the election and help mobilize more people to vote for climate action over the course of the election. Um, speaking of things that will probably take an election to change, um, there were a lot of questions about the carbon pricing. What is carbon pricing? <laughs> how, how does it actually work? And how much does it have to be? We have carbon pricing, we have a carbon tax in BC. Um, I don't see it doing a lot, right? So how much does it have to be before it works, and then how does that translate to what we pay at the pump? So just so you know, BC's carbon tax is absolutely and totally effective. It was identified by The Economist magazine as one of the most effective carbon policies on the planet. Uh, the results are in. Uh, you're, you started at $5 a ton, which is almost unnoticeable. It increased up to, I think, $30 a ton now. The carbon emissions in British Columbia have dropped compared to the rest of Canada over the time frame by 20%. Uh, that is more than enough to have met our Kyoto obligations. Uh, the economy grew at a slightly faster rate than the rest of Canada. So what that demonstrates is the first 20 or 30% is low-hanging fruit. It's a no-brainer. And, you know, the price for, I think it translates to around seven, 7 cents per year, <coughs> which is much smaller than normal fluctuations in the price of, of fuel. The reason it's effective is because people understand the signal is permanent. You know, it's smaller than the, than the fluctuations, but the whole graph has moved up. And that's one of the reasons people think it changes behavior. So BC, you should be proud of yourselves. This is, this is the single most successful carbon pricing regime on the planet. Uh, and you lowered your carbon emissions enough to meet Kyoto in five years. And Canada sat around for 12 years. So I would argue it, it is effective. Uh, and you've demonstrated to the rest of the country what we should be doing. So Ontario is now looking at pricing carbon, and I'm on their action group, so I'm helping them advise them about it. I think the easy stuff is you price carbon exactly the way BC has done it, and you make it revenue neutral, which you've done, right? So you lower payroll taxes and you raise carbon taxes, so you essentially it's revenue neutral. The easy stuff is the first 20 or 30%. The rest of the world has yet to do that, you guys have done it. What's harder is the next 20, 30, 40, or 50%. And I think that's where you need to get into slightly more complex uh, policies like cap and trade. So cap and trade is really where you say to an industry, you have a certain amount of emissions you're allowed to emit. It's going to lower over time. If you don't meet your targets, then you can you can trade. You can say essentially, I, I'm going to pay for someone else to lower their emissions. Um, the reason that I think it's really important, and the reason Ontario, I hope, will embrace it, uh, sort of a hybrid system. First of all, do what BC did; it worked. Get on with it. But to go farther, to, to certain industries that are carbon intensive. Cap and trade is important because there are other jurisdictions you can join with. So when Ontario goes forward, we're going to be joining with uh, Quebec and California into one giant cap and trade market. New Jersey will come in, Manitoba will come in, and you stitch together a large enough subnational market that you can presumably trade with Mexico, China, India. <coughs> Criticisms of cap and trade are they're multiple, and the devil's in the details. And I just spoke with somebody at the break about how Wall Street can game it and so on. So you've got to do it right. So I'm not going to get into that bit. 
you got to be careful you don't allow Wall Street to game the system, which they could do. But what's important is that if I'm a state-of-the-art Ontario manufacturer, and I've, got, I've gone through my carbon tax, I've retrofitted my building, I've brought my carbon emissions down 20%, I've done my piece, and now my factory's... The next 20% is difficult. And if I have to reduce my emissions by 20%, I'll become less competitive with a, with a factory down in Mexico or in India or in China, and you'll have industry simply move. So what, I, what you want that factory to be able to do is say, well, instead of lowering mine, I'm going to lower theirs. The criticism is you are funding other jurisdictions. Capital is flowing from Ontario to Mexico or to China to help those companies lower their emissions. That is a valid criticism. But if you don't allow cap and trade to do that, then you will make industries uncompetitive. And ultimately, when, when you have a large enough market, cap and trade is efficient because it finds the lowest cost solution. If it costs a dollar to, 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 to lower a ton of emissions in Mexico, and it costs $50 in Ontario, why would the next global ton of emissions reductions be the $50 and not the dollar? Right? Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, 20 years from now, when we're trying to get to 80% reductions in carbon, which we need to do, it has to be a single global market. There is no other way we are going to come close to those kinds of emissions reductions if we can't have the state-of-the-art factories paying for the retrofits of the unstate-of-the-art factories. As unfair as that may sound, it's efficient. And that's the only way we're going to get to the deep, deep, deep cuts of 80%. You have to be able to sort of trade emissions across borders and, and ensure you're going after the easy, easy targets first. So in my mind, it's a hybrid system. You do what BC did. You guys got it right. You demonstrated to the planet the first 20% is basically free. The economy kept growing. There were a couple losers. There were, cement, there were some cement plants, I think, that were hard hit. That, that's the nature of the game. Um, but then I think a cap and trade where we go around our, our federal capitals, the recalcitrants in Washington and, and Ottawa, hell of them. You can stitch together subnational markets that are of enough magnitude that you can act as if you were a national jurisdiction and you can join international carbon trading, which is ultimately how we're going to do the next phase and go from 20 to 80 percent. I'm really glad that you spoke to cap and trade and carbon tax and how they're you know, two sides of one coin because so many people get lost in, in the differences between the two and it just kind of creates a divide in the whole movement and it's very unnecessary. When I worked in Ottawa in 2008, the conversation at the policy level at that point, we still had a new heart for government and we thought you know, there was leverage where we could actually have these discussions with the Conservatives. It just it went nowhere, and within the climate movement, we had these arguments, and it's okay to have them within the movement, you know, at, in a tight group. But once it starts going out further, it's it's really unnecessary and not useful because the details don't matter if you don't even have the structures, and the details, you know, can be discussed when the time is necessary. So I'm glad to hear that was addressed. Um, I'd like to just really quickly address the climate justice argument um, and acknowledge that this is something that exists in the world. In Canada, pricing carbon makes a lot of sense given where our economy is at and you know, how developed our economy is. Um, a lot of my colleagues around the world would say we don't want any price on carbon in any form because we need no price on carbon. We need carbon emissions to go down. We just need it to go down. End of story. Which, which is a, a tricky thing because it's true. We need them to go down and... and Anyways, it's a tricky conversation, um, but that kind of goes into this whole um, argument about breaking down our system, starting over, and my understanding is that's kind of the premise of Naomi Klein's new book. I haven't had the pleasure to read it yet, but my understanding is she talks about kind of rejecting our systems, rejecting capitalism, and starting with something different, which I don't know what it is because I haven't read it yet, but I'm wondering if you have any comments on her book, her views, Right. Sure. I, I actually really like Naomi, Naomi's book. Um, I, I have some pretty deep disagreements. Um, but ultimately, I think what she does a really great job in stitching together is that climate affects everything, right? It's not a single issue. It is an issue about how developed and developing countries interact. Um, it is about how it is that you set up social safety nets because, you know, it, when you're going for really deep cuts and you're pricing carbon, it costs more at the pump or it costs more to heat your house. How do you deal with that? So I think she did a great job at saying this is a holistic problem, right? A single magic bullet doesn't solve it. If you're going to solve the climate problem, you have to also solve a whole lot of other problems. 
Um, what I don't really understand, I've never really understood, is how you replace a market economy. I, 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 I understand it's imperfect. I understand there's unfairnesses. I, you know, I'm a lefty, to be honest with you. I'm a venture capitalist, but I'm a lefty. I think there are deep unfairnesses in the system. But I don't know what you replace it with. I don't know what the alternative is. Um, humans have had market economies since the day we started trading stuff one for the other. And there have been unfairnesses from, from, from the get-go, too. So you deal with the unfairnesses as best you can. You deal with it through social safety nets and all the rest of it. It's an imperfect system. But I don't know what else there is. And she doesn't answer the question. She doesn't have, a, she doesn't have another uh, a, a solution either. I don't know that that's her job, to be fair. Just like it's not Russell Brand's job to have a solution. He's, his job is to criticize. Um, but ultimately, <laughs> there is a market. We live in a market economy. And that, that's, that's the point I make around the complexity of the market. That the one thing the right has to acknowledge is that the market has unfairnesses in it and that it will burn every piece of coal in the ground. And what the left has to acknowledge is there's nothing more powerful than the market. And if each can kind of suck it up, you've got, you've got, you've got the ability to say, okay, let's engineer a market so that it's fair and equitable. Let's engineer a market so that it finds a low carbon solution. The market is something we made. It's like an iPod or an iPad. <laughs> Is there an iPod? An iPod. It's like vinyl today. iPod. I've got an iPod. I do have an iPod. Um, it's like an iPad. It's something we engineered. It's an artifact. And the challenge is to engineer the market to solve these problems. And my challenge back to Naomi would be to say, isn't it possible to engineer a market that solves the questions of equity and justice that you legitimately have? Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what else you do. The challenge is to, is to engineer the market, not simply say, I'm going to throw it out and replace it with, I don't know what, right? I think, that, I think that's too glib. But I think she's a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, writer who sums up an enormously complex set of issues that are interrelated. I think that's what she's done a great job doing, is showing that justice is related to climate, right? That unfairness is endemic in the market unless you fix it and so on. So, you know, she's a smart cookie. Um, I just think... I just don't think you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The challenge is how do you engineer a market to solve the problems that she's, she's identified that are very real. I, I am actually reading the book. Fiona, you just finished reading it. Did you have a comment you wanted to? One example she gave early on in the book is Ontario and how they have developed their solar program. And their main incentive for doing that was to produce jobs and improve the economy. Or <laughs> one of the big incentives for government is, and that's where government is going to change, is by having these sorts of incentives in place where they can improve their local job economy. But then they got taken to court in the World Trade Tribunal for um, protectionism, I guess is what you'd call it. Sorry, I'm not sure if I have all the right terms, but basically the idea that, no, you can't do that. We're on a global market, and you need to be able to buy that material from anywhere in the world. So I'm curious how that kind of yeah. brought you for responsibility. Um, so she's absolutely right. Corporate interests have taken over the WTO. And the WTO is there to protect corporate interests. I completely agree with that, that criticism. So fix the WTO. Uh, that, that's my answer, right? I mean, I mean, the WTO answers to whomever has set the rules. And corporations have set the rules. They, they've run that agenda for the last 15, 20 years. The objective has been free trade. Um, I think at the expense of a lot of other things, but that was really the objective of, of the WTO. So the WTO is an organization like any other. You can engineer its rules. We can decide what it, what it, deci what, what it, what it takes as important, what the rules are. So my argument is, fix the thing, right? I agree it's broken, so fix it. So I can't summarize this question adequately, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, from an oil company's uh, CEO perspective, how else do you change the rules, particularly to positively affect the balance sheet without destroying the value of reserves and future cash flows that the market has already priced above the ground? So basically they're saying we've got this economic system our energy is priced based on as if it were already extracted. What is carbon pricing and other rule changes going to do to our economy that especially in Canada is so uh, reliant on uh, some industries will be hurt, and some industries will be helped. And as a country, we should emphasize investment in industries that will be helped. That's it. You can't have, you can't transform energy systems and decarbon the economy without there being casualties. It's impossible. Like I said, coal miners have to be out of work. The challenge is acknowledging that and finding a solution for that problem, like, for example, retraining them to retrofit buildings or something. But there will be casualties. And the problem, so Canada's problem is this, okay? If, 
Let's just say the Premier of Alberta, a year ago, had stood up at one of the international conferences and said, we as a developed country, a province, who's very wealthy, a lot of resources, there, we voluntarily will limit expansion of the oil sands to double what it is today. Right? Plans on the books with a triplet to say, voluntarily, I'm going to, because no one's talking about shutting them down. Nobody. Who's kidding who? Nobody is. What they've already got in operation is going to continue to operate, and you give it a bedtime clause. You know, give it 20 years, do what Eon did with their coal assets, spin it out and say there's 20 years of, of dividends coming from that, and then it's going to close up shop. It's like a REIT, like a real, you know. You're drunk, Tarzan, go home. You're drunk, Tarzan, go home. <laughs> but if the Premier of Alberta had done that two years ago, that, that was a card to play when oil was at $100 a barrel. Because, uh, because Alberta was giving something up. They were legitimately saying, I'm not going to expand endlessly, I'm going I'm to double it. I think in exchange, what they would have got is Keystone would have got approved, right? They would have got their, 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 market to oil, their oil to market. But because of the intransigence of the previous premier, Prentice is a smart guy, and the intransigence of our prime minister in not legitimately engaging on this issue, we lost all those cards. Right? Those cards only matter when they have value. Now that oil's gone to $50, and it looks like we're not going to even double production in the oil sands for the foreseeable future, there's, there is no card to play. Whereas we could have played that card, we could have got Keystone approved, and it would have been, I think there would have been some economic life there, right? Because we're not shutting that stuff off overnight, it's impossible. It'll take 20 years, 30 years. So I think that's where real engagement on this issue actually helps the oil and gas sector. And I would also point out the oil and gas sector. Here's another thing. Why are the emissions in Alberta, Alberta's emissions? Why don't they go with the oil? So if China wants to buy the oil, you get the emissions. I don't know if that argument would be accepted or not. But if you're at the table in good faith, you could ask for it. But Canada's not at the, at the table in good faith. So I would argue that by ignoring this issue and simply doing salesmanship, they have hurt the very industry they were trying to protect, which is the oil and gas sector, which is a lot of people employed doing a lot of good work in Alberta. They're not demons, right? We use the oil. So I think there's ways to go about solving this problem of being at the table in good faith. It's actually in the best interest of the industry itself, right? You can engineer a soft landing. You can, you can, you can put in these sort of sunset clauses in your industry where you let it land, just like E.O.N. has done with their, with their nuclear and coal assets. Right? And I would also note that the oil and gas sector in Canada has been, with a few exceptions, have been asking for clarity on carbon policy for a long, long time. Because what do people who make big long-term investments in the billions of dollars want? They want certainty. That's what they want. Because it's debt, and debt wants certainty. Debt has 20-year time horizons. So the oil and gas sector has been ahead of our own prime minister, who thinks he's doing them a favor by trying to sell that stuff to the world. And what the oil and gas sector really needs is a mature conversation at the international table in good faith about how we're going to meet our, our obligations because that would have got their oil to market and it would give them long-term price certainty, which is what they want. But now that we're hammered by $50 oil, we don't have that card to play anymore, right? It's, it's, it's been squandered. And now we're just going to kind of struggle with, struggle with what we've got and, and pretend we're nice guys because the missions won't double over the next five years and pretend we did it on purpose. <laughs> okay, so we're just about out of time, but I'd like to give each of the panelists and Tom a bit of a couple of minutes for a closing remarks. So anyone want to go first? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll lead the conversation back to despair. <laughs> <laughs> I was putting uh, some figures together a couple of weeks ago, and there's an organization that keeps track of how, how much CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere over time. And I happened to notice the number for 2014 was globally 36% above 1990 levels. And if you remember Kyoto, we were supposed to be 5% below 1990 levels, so we're almost 40% in the wrong direction. And we've really not even started to feather the brakes to slow it down. And so from the scientific perspective, there really is a sense of urgency uh, to get this done. And so I, I'm the doom and gloom guy that has you know, the science that says that we're screwed um, if we go on our, our, our business as usual path. And, and there's a lot of justification for that. Um, on the other hand, to, to try to look on the bright side, every now and then there's, there's a glimmer of hope. And, and I think I saw that 
Germany is producing, and I may have these numbers not quite right, but it was something in the neighborhood of 30% of its energy demand, energy needs for renewable energy yeah. now. And that on, I think it was this year, there was one day where they, they on a good day, they reached 75% on one single day. And I also seem to recall seeing that Denmark is now producing 46% of its energy, elect electric energy from, from wind. I'll leave it there. I just want to say thank you for everyone for coming out, especially to Tom for coming to talk to us about such important issues that we all need to be more educated on and just spread the love and the education and tell all your children and your grandchildren and your friends about what you've learned here tonight and spread your passion and make changes, little changes, big changes, whatever you can do, get out, volunteer, join the Citizens Climate Lobby, join the Eco Society, go on Tom's website, there's so much information out there. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, I, I echo that. You know, um, it's late on a on a Monday night, and, and there's a big Nelson crew still here listening to us talk about very dark subjects. Um, that's important. That's really important. I think it's a it's a it's a real example. As I said when I started, there are towns an order of magnitude larger than you who wouldn't have got out this crowd. So it's a real testament to the town. It's a real testament to the people who who organize this event. And I am deeply appreciative. Of, of the fact that you're here and the fact that you listened to, to me talk. Uh, it makes my life worth living. <laughs> uh, and an optimistic note. I agree with Dr. Bloom over here. I, I'm actually, I really, I really quite, quite like our conversations, actually, and I'm, I'm sure we'll become good friends. Um, if solar doubles six more times, you can imagine that, right? The amount of solar in the world doubles six more times which is done a few to, uh, since 2010, has doubled a couple times already. If it doubles six more times, there's enough solar energy in the world to replace all of our primary energy sources, nuclear, natural, ga natural gas, coal, oil, everything. Now you need to get it to where it needs to go. You need some energy storage in there. You need some, lots of batteries and cars. That's all, there's all of the ancillary stuff. But as a primary energy source, the ability to run our planet, keep our factories going, you double solar six more times and you've got the job done. And if this was, and if America was this big, I use America as an example, just because that's what the stats America is this big, my fingernail of, of solar panels will power the entire country. Right? This is possible. And it's, it can happen within my lifetime, easily, if solar doubles six more times. And it may well just do that. You know, I think I just mostly want to thank Tom for coming. That's truly inspirational and echo Mel's uh, feelings of being inspired. I have to say that your book and the information that you're sharing gives me one of the strongest sense of hopes that I've had in a long time. So thank you very much for that. So thank you also for coming, but I'm not going to fixate on that because they did. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it's really important that we all walk away and do something. That's, that's all I can really say, but I'm going to say more. Um, you know, there is doom and gloom, but the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is, you know, a body of scientists put together by governments around the world, so it's a fairly conservative panel of scientists, they say that we can stay below two degrees. They say it's still possible. We just need to bring it in really fast. We've spent two-thirds of our carbon budget by 2011. So we have one-third left, basically. So it has to happen now, but it's still possible. So I'm still on the optimistic side, and I'm especially optimistic when I'm a part of things like um, the People's Climate March that happened in September of 2014, where in Nelson we had 300 people rally and walk through the streets you know, and just take back the streets. It wasn't a big deal, but it was a big deal because this isn't something we commonly do. And it was a taste of getting uncomfortable. So, so that combined with having these conversations with our peers, with our family, really uncomfortable conversations in all these different circles we run in about what we need to do to build the will to move the policy forward with our elected officials at our municipal, at our provincial and our federal level and then honing in on what else we can do personally. And what you, once you start looking at your life and what you can do, it's infectious. You can't stop, and then you become an activist, and then, and then you're just on stage ranting at the end of a thing. But anyway, it's just so important we all do something, otherwise we've given up, and if we've given up, then we are pessimists. 
So let's not give up. Let's do it together as a community because we are so creative and amazing in this community that we can do it. Thank you to all of our panelists. It's been a real pleasure to moderate for you this evening. And thanks to all of you again for coming up. The slideshow presentation will be posted on Tom's website, tomrand.net, and we'll post it on the Eco Society Facebook and website as well. Uh, thanks again to all the sponsors and volunteers who made this possible, and to you for coming. And we'll see you at the next meeting. gonna be all right the sun is shining the world is changing might be slow but at least we'll try hours we we'll switch hands and together we'll all stand as the youth of now grow old with lived in some strange times grow old do you lose that young soul and that you you were before in this strange world with strange ways and lost souls lose change hold it does it matter in this strange house with strange friends I don't know maybe it's just pretend gonna be all right the sun is shining the world is changing might be slow but at least we'll try powers will switch hands and together we'll all stand as the youth of now grow old we're addicted to black gold In this strange world